Okay, uh, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, session on machine learning with and for software engineering number six. Uh, so for this session, we will have six presentations. Uh, we will have, um, there will be presented uh, one after the other and we will be having the discussion period after all the presentations. But if you have any quick question or just cl clarification after a presentation, so we, we, we can accept like one quick uh, question or clarification and keep the rest of discussions at the end. So we will start by the first presentation uh, on the paper titled Deep FD, Automated Fault uh, Diagnosis and Localization for Deep Learning Programs. It will be presented by Jalun. I hope I'm pronouncing Hello. correct your name. Yes, yes, you're correct. Thank That's you. Great. So, yes, yes please. So, may I share okay. my screen? Okay. So can you see my screen now? Yes. That's yes. Great. Okay. Please so that's okay. So let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. It is my great honor to introduce our work, DeepFD Automated for Diagnosis and Localization for Deep Learning Programs, to all of you. Before I start, I would like to introduce the cooperators from five institutions. It is a great honor to work with you. So let's get started. Deep learning systems are widely used in our daily life. How to automatically debug such systems become essential. So our work is designed for debugging DL systems. It is the learning-based for diagnosis and localization framework. Saying learning-based, it, it is because we regard the for diagnosis problem as a multi-label classification problem. It learns to distinguish the normal and buggy DL models according to their runtime features. It goes beyond the bug detection. It can also diagnose the root cause of the faults and pinpoint the faulty lines in the program. The secret of DeepFD is that some runtime information exhibits significant correlations with certain types of faults. For example, the figure shows the distribution of several features when the learning rate and function are faulty, painted in red, or not faulty, painted in blue. We can observe that there's obvious statistical difference when the learning rate or loss function are set appropriately or not. The observation enables us to perform for diagnosis and localization as a learning problem by leveraging the relevant stochastic runtime information of a buggy DL program. Based on this idea, we then zoom out to a bigger view. Is the whole picture of DeepFD. The upper part is the workflow of DeepFD, while the lower part is the preparation steps for it. We skip the details of the lower part and briefly introduce the upper part. The workflow of DeepFD comprises three steps. Given a program, DeepFD constructs a DL architecture and collects the runtime data such as the loss and neurons information by training the DL models. After applying a series of statistic operators, the diagnostic features are produced. Then we infer the possible types of faults using the pre-trained diagnosis models pre prepared by the lower part in the previous slide. And since there are usually more than one faults in a program, so we adopt the multi-label classification models so that one buggy program could be assigned to more than one fault types. Finally, it goes through the nodes of the parsed abstract syntax tree, traverses assignments and expressions, and identifies the lines where the diagnosed types of faults are defined. Note that currently the diagnosed models are trained to classify five major types of faults, including unsuitable loss function, optimizer activation functions, insufficient training iterations, and the inappropriate learning rate. We made it extensible for supporting more types of faults. We also constructed a benchmark with 58 buggy DL programs from Stack Overflow and GitHub. The benchmark includes 40 programs, the patches, usually more than one, the types of faults and line numbers where the faults are introduced. The left-hand side shows the number of each types of faults in the benchmark. And 
highlighted in, in yellow, we can see that the top five types of faults account for more than 70% cases. This is the reason why we our current DBFD are designed to debug these five types of faults. In addition, we further present the statistics of the number of faults type in blue and number of faulty lines in red. We can see that over half of our program contains more than one fault type, and most of them involve more than one line, one lines. And this observation motivates us to adopt the multi-label classification algorithms. In conclusion, uh, DeepFD maps the fault localization task on DL programs to a learning problem. We also constructed a benchmark for future fault, doc fault localization works. Uh, the work encapsulate the fault seeding, uh, faulty program checking, feature extraction, fault diagnosis and localization, and it has been made online available. That's all for our presentation. That's all for the presentation. Thanks for listening. All questions are and corporations are welcomed. We are glad to hear from you. Thank you very much, uh, Jalu, for this very nice presentation. So uh, our next presentation. Uh, will be uh, named the, for the paper Fast Chain Set Based Bug Localization with BERT, uh, will be presented by uh, Angie Nesta. Okay, hello everyone. Let me just. Hello. Screen. Okay. So let's start. Uh, the, tar the title of the paper is Fast Change to Based Bug Localization with BERT. So in this paper, we propose a bug localization tool that focuses on three things. First, we want to locate bug introducing change sets, since change sets are typically easier for developer to examine, and they also contain other useful information, such as change set log or a timestamp. Uh, secondly, we want to capture semantics of input documents, and finally, a fast retrieval, and this essentially means we want to quickly localize relevant change sets and minimize the time a developer has to wait for the result. So to address those four, uh, three requirements, we propose FBLBERT. FBLBERT uses BERT to capture semantics and late interaction architecture that enables efficient retrieval. So how it works. Uh, first, the model process bug report and a change set separately through BERT and linear layer, and then it creates a matrix for each of them. Uh, next, for each word vector in a bug report, we look for the most similar word vector in a change set. Then we sum the cosine similarities between the most similar pairs, and we have our final score. Uh, there are two main advantages of this approach. So first, it preserves information at the level of words, which should help in capturing explicit code tokens in a bug report. And the other thing is that the model is optimized toward maximum similarity of vectors. And this means that we can find uh, first uh, find potentially relevant change set based on whether they have similar word vectors to our bug report. So in practice, uh, using FBL BERT consists of three steps. First, of course, we train the model. Secondly, we take all of the change sets and encode them with the trained model. Then we put the encoded change set into an index, uh, preferably the index should support efficient vector similarity search. Uh, in our case, we used twice. And finally, we have our last step that is retrieval. So when a bug report arrives, it is first processed by FBLBERT. And then we do exactly the same thing as we did during the training. So we will take every word vector from a bug report and ask the index to give us the most similar word vector in a change set. Our goal here is to find top, let's say, top 1,000 good candidate change set, which have similar word vectors to our bug report. Having that, we will now use the pipeline to actually rank only our good candidates. So in this table here, we show retrieval accuracy measured to have reciprocal rank. As our baseline, we use Locus, which is a vector space model, and two T-BERT models, which are recently proposed deep learning models, also for change set retrieval. Uh, overall, we can see that FBLBERT performs better than Locus and both TBERT architectures. Uh, however, the question is why and when. So we decided to look into results for different types of bug reports. We have not localized, partially localized, and finally, fully localized bug reports. Uh, looking at the results uh, for not localized and partially localized bug reports, we see that all BERT-based models perform better than uh, Locus for not localized bug reports. 
for partially localized bug reports, so the second column, uh, locus improves. However, it still stays behind uh, BERT models. Uh, looking at the results for fully localized bug reports, uh, one may ask a question why the performance now drops for both uh, T-BERT models and also our FBL BERT. Uh, we decided to get a better understanding and we did an error analysis. We observed that very often a bug report that is fully localized, localized contains a few stack traces or code snippets. Uh, in case of FBL BERT, it leads to the model being basically flooded by code tokens so that the model is struggling to decide which code token is important, which in the end affects the final performance. Uh, all in all, we can say that we see improvement in retrieval accuracy when using FBL BERT. However, it works best for bug reports that have no or a few class mentions. Uh, let's also look at the time that is required to retrieve relevant change set. In this figure, we can see the retrieval time per one bug report given different sizes of a search space. Here we see that FBL BERT that is marked with squares retrieves relevant change sets faster than both TBERT models. Another thing is that while for T-BERT models, we can see that the retrieval time increases as the search space grows. For FBL BERT, the trained line flattens, so it indicates that the model scales up well with respect to growing number of documents. And a confirmation also of the statement uh, is visible in the table on the right, where we can see how each of the models scales depending on the number of documents uh, that we are uh, looking through. And that is all. Thank you. Okay, great. So you are in time. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Uh, any quick question or comment? Otherwise, uh, we go to the third presentation of the paper titled Multilingual Training for Software Engineering uh, that will be presented by Tufik. So please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, give me a minute. So can you screen my, uh, see my screen? Yes. OK, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to present our recent ICSI paper, Multilingual Training for Software Engineering. I'm Tofik. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate from UC Davis. Uh, this work was done by uh, me and my advisor, Professor Prem Kumar Devanpo. So modern deep learning models have millions and billions of parameters. It is very difficult to train such model with limited amount of training data. So in this paper, we propose a novel approach to augmenting the training data set. So these are the motivation of our work. As you all know, data creation or curation is a slow and effortful process. It always requires some form of human involvement to generate the data. And we have also seen that for some languages uh, like Ruby, the label data set is not that abundant. And for some languages, the data may be more domain specific. We also found that most of the, uh, for several uh, deep learning based, uh, for several software engineering tasks, the performance of the deep learning model depends on identifier. And identifiers are not language specific. That's mostly depends on the algorithm. So if you are implementing a, an, an algorithm in multiple languages, there's a high possibility that you will use the similar set of identifiers. So these two findings inspired us to investigate the uh, potential of multilingual fine tuning in software engineering tasks. So we tried this idea on three popular software engineering tasks. Let me introduce you to the task first. So the first task was uh, code summarization or code common synthesis. The second one, code retrieval or code search from natural language description. And the third one, extreme summarization of method name prediction. For all these three tasks, we use code dataset, data set, uh, which is a modified version of code search net. Um, this data set is multilingual and the data comes from six different languages, uh, Ruby, JavaScript, Java, Python, PHP, and Go. So multilingual training is not a very new idea. Um, there are several papers in natural language processing domain that have very, uh, reported that it is very beneficial for low resource languages. So the benefits are observed in two situations when the language are low resource and the language are related uh, to each other. So we have a very similar situation here in Codis 3 dataset. For Ruby and JavaScript, we don't have enough uh, samples to train a model properly. And we also believe that uh, these uh, languages are related to each other by the identifiers. So we look into that um, um, 
that uh, we look into some research question about that in the later part of my presentation. So there is another advantage of using multilingual uh, train model. So when we are replacing a multilingual, uh, a monolingual model with a multilingual one, we are actually replacing multiple models with one. So uh, deploying multilingual model is more practical and easy. So I have uh, talked about two basic idea that uh, inspire us to uh, apply multilingual training in soft ranging tasks. And we have two research question. The first one is what role uh, do identifiers play in code summarization task? So when we abstract out the identifier in code summarization task, we observe that the performance of the deep learning model drops a lot. But when we abstract out the other tokens like keywords, the operator and the separators, the performance does not change that much. And the second research question, do programs that solve same problem in different languages tend to use similar in different names? We use Rosetta code that provides us uh, multiple implementation of the same algorithm in different languages. And from that data set, we also observe that like for a similar algorithm, people tend to use the uh, same set of identifiers. So please look into our paper if you are really interested about these two research question. Um, so in this slide, I will introduce you uh, to the metric and model you are using for code summarization. We are using code bird and graph code bird, and the metric is blue four. For code search, we are using the same two models and we use the mean reciprocal rank as the performance uh, to measure the performance. And for the method name prediction task, we have F score. So this is the performance what we achieved uh, using multilingual training in code summarization tasks. So these two columns presents the monolingually trained models performance. So for CodeBird, uh, we achieved 17.83, which is exactly same as, uh, uh, the, uh, as the number reported in the original CodeBird paper. And for Craft CodeBird, we achieved 18.08 with monolingual training. With multilingual training, the performance goes up. For polyglot code bird, we achieved 19.06, which is 6.90% more than this original code bird paper. And for the polyglot graph code bird, we achieve 19.10, which is 5.64% more. So note that for the low resource languages that I already mentioned, Ruby and JavaScript, the performance improvement is higher. For code bird, um, we can see like 17.72% improvement for Ruby with uh, multilingual code bird and 14% for JavaScript. And for high resource languages that the language which has more than 150,000 examples, uh, we have also seen like two to 4% improvement also there. So this is the uh, table that compares the, our, uh, the performance of our models with the uh, state of the arts uh, uh, during the writing of this paper. So we can see that our polyglot code bird and graph code bird uh, outperforms the other models by significant margin. As I already mentioned, we have tried this multilingual training in two more tasks. For code search problem, we observed 2.74% improvement with the code bird model. And with multilingual graph code bird, we observed 1.54%. And for this uh, method and prediction task, we have 10.09%. Sorry for interrupting. So you, can you uh, um, like conclude? You, you exceeded the allowed time, please. Yes. So let me uh, summarize the overall contribution of our work. So we showed that identifier name choice is well conserved across languages. That means identifier mostly dependent on the algorithm, not the programming language. We also showed in a paper cross language training helps. So if you have a, a larger data set on Python and a smaller data set in Ruby, if you train the model with Python data, that may help the Ruby data set. And the identifier matters more in the training data, uh, identifier matter more in training data in code summarization task. We have a research question to support this uh, statement. And finally, we showed multilingual training data improves performance on several tasks. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tufik, for this nice presentation. Uh, next presentation will be on paper titled uh, Neuron Fair Interpretable White Box Fairness Testing Through Bayesian Neuron Identification that will be presented by Hybeam. 
And um, thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is PhD candidate of Zhejiang University of Technology in China. The paper I will be presenting today is titled Neurofair. Nowadays, algorithms provide us with convenience, but the issue of bias in the decision making process cannot be ignored either. Several institutions are also committed to the realization of deep learning fairness test fairness. The existing fairness testing methods can be divided into three types. The first is testing method for traditional machine learning. This method cannot be applied to deep models. The second is method for traditional machine learning, but can be applied to test DNNs after modification. The third is method specially designed for DNNs. These works are limited in practice due to at least one of the following reasons. Can hardly be general, generalized to unstructured data, challenged by gradient formation, hardly provide interpretability. Okay. Here we gave the basic knowledge. The first is data form. The second is discriminatory instance determination. The third is the discrimination analysis based on decision boundary. Then we introduce the motivation. First, the decision re results of DNNs are determined by nonlinear combination of each neuron's activation state. Thus, we imagine whether the biased decisions are caused by some neurons. Secondly, we try to observe the neural activation state in DNNs hidden there through fading instance pairs. Third, we automatically identify bias the neurons. Okay. Our design goals and solutions are as follows. Neurofear contains three main steps. The first, uh, first, according to the previous definition, we draw the AS curve of each layer. Yes. Next, the layer with the largest AOC value is selected as the most biased layer. Finally, we adaptively identify biased neurons. The discriminatory instance generation include a global face and a local face. The global face is increased as a diversity. Here we use momentum-based accelerated search. First, uh, determine the search direction and then add perturbations. Repeating this operation for the remaining instance. Okay. And the discriminatory instance obtained in the global phase are used as a seed for the local phase. Similarly, we use an instance as a seed. Then add the term then determine the search direction and then add the perturbations. Repeat the operation. And step three is instance generation on unstructured data. We first leverage adversarial attack to generate sensitive edge build perturbation. Then we craft the bias perturbation. Finally, we add both to original face image. And this is data set information. These are baselines we adopted. These are metrics and the parameter setting. We evaluate neurofield by answering five research questions. Okay. First, the neurofield generates more instances than baselines, especially for densely code structured data. Okay. A neurofield generates much more instances than our baselines in the global phase, which is beneficial to increasing the diversity of neurofield's instance in the local phase. Next, the neurofield is robust to the high parameters. The GSR value of neurofield are higher than that of baselines on almost data sets. In our case, it can generate more diverse, diverse instances. The instance generated by neurofail contribute more to fairness improvement. This is a summary. 
Second question, neural fare is more efficient in generation speeds. The main reason for its utility is that its instance can activate more biased neurons. In our case, AOC can correctly distinguish DNS fairness violations. This is a summary. Okay. The final question. Among image date, image instance of neural fare are of higher quality. The generated test instance are similar to the state inputs. Neural fare contributes more to the fairness improvement of the face detector. This is a summary. Okay, in conclusion, we propose neural fare. It performs well on interpretability, efficiency, and generalization. We conduct detailed experiments to evaluate performance of neural fare on seven real-world data sets. Finally, we systematically analyze neural fare from five aspects. And thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Hai Bin, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, we have the next thank presentation on, on the paper uh, type for why practical deep similarity learning based type inference for Python that will be presented by Amir. Uh, <coughs> Hi everyone, can you hear my voice? Yes, we hear you. Uh, can you see the slides? We see the slides. Can you make full screen yeah, present the mode? Of course. Okay, that's uh, great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Mir. Uh, today, I'm going to present our for Pi, our technical paper at XC22. Uh, as we know, Python is easy to use and it allows rapid prototyping. On the other hand, uh, due to the lack of aesthetic types in Python, developers often encounter type errors like this example. And Python, of course, supports for optional type annotations, meaning that developers can add uh, type annotations gradually to their code base. However, this is a daunting task, and motivated, motivated by this, researchers have recently proposed ML-based type prediction models, and there are some static type reference tools also for this task. Uh, in this space, ML-based type prediction, we have identified a challenge and a problem. The, the, the main challenge is that to suggest the correct type in the top one is very challenging for the ML models. I mean, as we know, the uh, ML models usually give a list of predictions. It could be top five or top 10. And also research has shown that developers tend to use the first suggestion by a tool. So it would be very desirable for the ML model to give the correct prediction in top one or in the first location. Also, the, the main problem that we identified in this space is that developer provided type annotations are not always or may not always be valid for training and evaluation. And therefore, it is essential to type check the data set to make sure at least the evaluation set uh, is valid for uh, evaluation. In this paper, we present type for Pi. It is based on deep similarity learning and hierarchical neural networks. And Part of our contribution is to have a type check data set, and also we have a Visual Studio Code extension which provides ML based type of the completion for Python. And now, and now I would like to talk about our proposed approach. Uh, this is the overview of type for Pi. Uh, first, we, all, we extract abstract syntax trees or ASTs from Python source code files. And from ASDs, we extract features like identifiers, code tokens, and visible types uh, in order to predict types. Uh, next, we extract token embeddings from the extracted features. And the, in the model, we have in, in the middle, we have a type for point model. And at the prediction phase, we have the learn type clusters to suggest types for test samples using k nearest neighbor search. Uh, I have one code snippet here to explain the type hints or features that we use to predict types. Uh, we have visible types, which is extracted from import statements uh, from Python files and their uh, transitive dependency set. Uh, we also extract identifiers uh, from code, like function name, parameter names, or variable names. We also consider code context, which is the usage of parameters and variables inside the function body 
like shown in this example. Uh, this is a pi for pi model. It consists of two RNNs or recurrent neural networks with uh, LSTM cells. And we, have, we also have a final linear, linear layer, layer that produces uh, type embeddings for type clusters. Uh, we have extended uh, our many types for pi data set for this work and we perform code application, which is an essential step. Uh, we augmented our data set to add more variable type annotation using Pyre, a static type inference tool. Uh, last but not least, we perform type checking using MyPy to make sure that uh, source code source code files or type check are ground truth for both training and evaluation are valid and type correct. Uh, now I will talk about the evaluation of type for Pi. Uh, in general, we have three research questions. Uh, the first research question is about the general performance of type for Pi. Uh, due to the time constraint, I only present the first research question. Uh, considering the top one, an exact match type for Pi achieves around 76%, which is uh, significantly better than both state of the art approaches, type plus and type writers, as we can see here. Also, considering the MMR score type for Pi again outperforms both approaches. Uh, I, I also want to talk about TyFropy deployment in practice. This is the deployment of TyFropy. We have the Visual Studio Code extension, as I said, uh, for developers at the client side. Uh, we also have a production model on our Kubernetes classes. We also provide a local model for developers for privacy reasons. Uh, this is the VS Code extension. As of now, it has more than 1,100 installations. This is one example from the Visual Studio Code environment that it provides type of ML-based type of completion that developers can use to gradually type, add type annotations to their code, Python code bases. Uh, to conclude the work and consider the future work, uh, maybe using pointer networks can be a promising direction. Also, we would like to study how to improve type for Pi uh, from its usage in VS Code and the telemetry data that we have. Also, complementing type for Pi with a static type inference also might be also promising direction to try for future work. And we also made our code and data set uh, available on GitHub and Zenodo. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for your attention and joining this session. And I'm also available for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Amir, for this beautiful presentation. And uh, now we are uh, on the last presentation for this session on the paper titled Decomposing Convolutional Neural Networks into Reusable and Replaceable Modules uh, that will be presented by Ranjit. Can you can see my screen? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rangit Pan. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at the Iowa State University and I'm presenting our work with my advisor, Rita Srajan. Today I'm going to tell you about an approach to decompose convolution neural network into modules to enable the reusability and replaceability. We envision that decomposing model into modules can help to solve real world problems, for instance, in the past, Google Photo app tagged a black woman as gorilla. Not only that, recently Facebook and known as Meta also had a similar instance where a black man has been labeled as primates on a video. While we do not have the information how Meta resolved the issue, too, we found that to resolve the similar issue, Google has decided to remove the output class gorilla by suppressing the output level. In fact, they have suppressed the output for chimpanzee, monkey, chimp, etc., from the model that recognizes a wide range of images, uh, for example, car, human face, etc. Though the problem can be temporarily solved by suppressing output level to fix the model, one needs to retrain the model. Suppose we can decompose a CNN model into modules, one for each output class. Also, suppose we have another working model trained with the same or a subset of data set with gorilla and person output class. And if we can decompose, 
And also the later model does not exhibit the behavior present in the faulty one. Then we decompose the model and replace the faulty gorilla module with the working gorilla module that does not exhibit the incorrect behavior. Other solution include creation of small model and use it as module. Or we can remove the gorilla module from the collection, which is similar to what Google did to resolve the problem. We introduced the notion of the decomposition in our previous work published in SACC20. We proposed an approach to decompose the dense based deep neural networks into reusable and replaceable models. However, that work focused on dense based networks, did not explore more complex set of models such as convolution neural networks. That work relies on the dense architecture of the models where nodes and edges have a one-to-one -one relationship. In contrast, edges in CNN are shared among the, all the inputs and outputs. Also prior work performed backtracking mechanism to decompose the module, which is only applicable to the dense base layers. Our approach starts with a trend model. For instance, in this case, a model that recognizes image level as A to D. First, our approach identifies the section in the CNN that is responsible for a single output class. Since removing nodes for all the non constant output class, the modified section acts as a single class classifier. To add the notion of the negative output classes, we add a limited section of the inputs from the unconstant output classes. Finally, we channel the concern to create a module. In this context, we use concern and unconscious uh, as terminology that represent the input belonging to the output class for which a module has been created and all other output classes respectively. For example, for module A, output cla class A is the concern output class and other output class such as B, C, D are the unconscious classes. We answer three research questions. Does decomposition involve cost? How modules can be reused or replaced to build new problems compared to training a model from scratch? And does reusing and replacing modules emit less CO2? Overall, we found that there is a cost of decomposition, but that is trivial. Also, we showed that possibility of reusing and replacing modules. Also, we found that for all cases, Compose models using modules emits less CO2 compared to the training model from scratch. To that end, uh, we propose an approach to decompose convolution neural network for image based classification problems into modules, one for each output class. We show how real world issues, such as issues that Google and Meta faced earlier with incorrect classification, can be addressed by decomposing a model into modules instead of training from scratch. We discuss the methodology a three step process taking the monolithic model as input. The output is a series of modules that is a binary classifier. We answer three research questions uh, that's related to the cost of the decomposition, the possibilities of reusing and replacing the modules, and the consumption of CO2 in reusing these modules compared to the model trained from scratch. We made the preprint available and also our 20, uh, longer videos available in the Confer Researcher where you can find more detailed description. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ranjit, for this very nice presentation. And thank you all presenters for this uh, awesome and congrats again for having your papers uh, published in, in EXE. So let us have. Uh, session of questions i think there are already so many questions on in the chat box so first question for angeniska i think she already answered in uh, the chat there is also one question for tufik did you look at tasks where a single snippet can contain multiple languages such as julia embedding a matlab snippet for example thinking in terms of either summarizing such methods while considering both languages involved or code completion that can switch between languages so for you to uh, uh, 
actually in our paper we have not tried such approaches yet like uh, using a single snippet that can contain multiple languages but uh, from my experience i believe that uh, if you have a few examples of such type then this uh, multilingual training can help for at least code summarization task so i'm not sure about this uh, code completion task because that is not uh, identified heavy that is more dependent on the syntax and when we do this multilingual training um it is difficult to say uh, that we can perfectly generate the code comp uh, do the perfectly perfect code completion task with multilingual training if we are asking for like for some partial completion that is uh, i think possible uh thank you so thank you to pick for your answer i think there is another question for you uh have you done any work on zero shot summarization or other tasks on another low resource language that was not included in the pre-training like r um in our uh there was uh, in the original code but paper that was in evaluated on c sharp and they got good results so for our work that is so we are doing multilingual training so we have a big uh, data set so our decoder is stronger it is like trained to generate a natural language description so i believe if we i'm not sure about the zero shot training but with a few samples like maybe 10 to 15 um this uh, multilingually trained model can give you uh, i think reasonable summarization on the deduplicated data set okay thank you Tofik, or then there is another question for Ranji. How is the robustness of the decomposited modules against fairness or attacks? Uh, uh, that is a really nice question. And for at least this work, we did not study the robustness or the fairness for the attacks. However, what we believe that the decomposed modules are uh, similar as the decomposed model I mean uh, decomposed software they should have the same traits or the properties that the parent has since the reason is that since they are decomposed to enable reusability and replaceability that was our uh, goal to achieve they we decomposed in vertical way and so if there are properties that is present over all the models in layer wise and we believe those properties will still be present in the decomposed model however it needs further investigation and in fact there's a very nice uh, line of work you proposed definitely i will personally look into that okay thank you ranjit uh, do you have any other questions or comments even from presenters, you can ask each other questions. I have from a question audience. for uh, Jialun, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, first of all, that is a really nice work. So I have two questions. First one is that you okay. say in your paper that there's a significant number of bugs you found there, uh, where a significant number of programs you find found where there are more than one bugs. So uh, yes. are, are the programs being found from the real world? Because I, we have, I mean, I, I was one, I did a study I mean, with other co-authors in the back in the second 19, where we found different uh, stack overflow bugs and classified the deep learning bug. But we mostly found the bugs, um, code has a single bug. So, my question is that let me refresh. So, how often do you find that that there are programs where more than one bugs are present in the real world? Okay, so may I share the screen? Okay, so uh, maybe I can share the screen. Yes. No. Okay. We do, we do not see your screen, Jianlong. Okay. I need to find my slide. Okay, here. 
Um, okay. So can you now see? Yes, okay. we see your screen. Okay. So you mean the? So I mean this one, right? So we can see from the right right hand side the statistics. Uh, they are actually uh, twenty four over uh, fifty eight, like half of the programs are. Um, are uh, tens one uh, types of fault, yes, which equals the result that you uh, can uh, you concluded before. But uh, after we uh, actually we when we reproduce and repair the programs, we not only use the accepted answers in the stack overflow, we also try out all the answers that suggested. And sometimes we find that there are other bugs in the program, uh, not only the accepted answers. So that's maybe the reason why we found more bugs uh, in in that program. Yes, and um, thank you, thank you for answering that. In fact, I have a okay. follow-up. Since you said there are multiple bugs, will that will it, can it be? Uh, done by there are works that localize and fix a single deep learning box can we run those uh, tools multiple times to fix multiple bugs for example a code that has three bugs can we run I mean for example a tool x run first time it fixed the bug one then once it fixed we found the bug two we ran the tool again and if in it uh, number of instances we run can it be done by that way too? And did you see uh, if there are any application of such approaches? Yes, it is possible. So that's the reason why uh, when we run the, the debugging, we run each uh, DL programs 10 times and collect all the results. And uh, we take the union of the diagnosed types as the uh, uh, final, final results. Yes, so so the situation you mentioned also uh, happens a lot of times. Thank you, Jalun. Thank you, Franji, okay. for the Thank question, you. for the answer. Do you have guys any other question or comment from the audience, from presenters? So otherwise, maybe you can have one comment on or one question to Jalun. So you have multiple classes for for these kind of uh, uh, bugs or defects. So I'm wondering your ground truth, how did you get it and how did you validate it? Uh, the class, the, did you do some manual labeling or validation for your data set? Uh, so may I share my screen again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay, so for the for how we collect the benchmarks and how we manually uh, construct it, uh, so we can see here uh, since the programs or the code snippet in the uh, Stoggle flow and the GitHub uh, they did not actually provide the actual repair, so we manually reproduce all the bugs. Uh, whether it's runnable complete and whether the bug symptoms matches the description. If so, we will further uh, apply all the patches and try to repair the programs. So uh, this uh, this process involves uh, manual labeling and we will repair uh, to confirm whether the uh, fault types are really faults in that program and whether the patches will really fix the bug. Yeah, and uh, so so when you do uh, debugging, uh, uh, so since the, the deep learning programs are stochastic, uh, sometimes yes, yes. don't get the, 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 the same execution. So did you get any trouble with that when reproducing or debugging the code, reproducing the bugs? Uh, yes, the stochastic world in what uh, introduced uh, several the first sometimes the accuracy will ranges from like uh, in a 
uh, large range. So we, uh, for every repair and every uh, buggy progress, we will run it like 10 times, need 10 times to get the average result. So it, uh, to reduce the randomness, uh, randomness impact. And second is that after repair, how can we ensure the the patches is actually the patch? So for that, we uh, can. Uh, it should be here. So for here, uh, so uh, to uh, to validate whether a patch is actually the patch, uh, we will uh, check whether uh, there is a statistical difference between uh, the accuracies from the buggy program and the corrected corrected programs. So there are two difficulties. Okay, thank you very much, Jalong. Very interesting work. So that's why we had many questions on that. Or oh, oh, actually, all papers okay, are very, very interesting. So do you have uh, any other questions or comments from audience? We still have time. Uh, otherwise, I can have a question, quick question for Ranji. So how, how do you measure your model reusability and uh, replaceability? Is there any systematic ways to measure them? So when we uh, measure that uh, efficiency, reusability, and replaceability, we compare with them from scratch. For example, we have it, I'm taking the example from our previous paper. So yes, we have a model MNIST that recognizes um, DG zero to nine, and we decomposed a model. I um, mean, decompose the model into modules for each output class zero, one, two, and so on. Then maybe a reuse scenario where we need to build a binary classifier. We take the zero and one module. We make a compost model using those modules. And on the other hand, we train a model taking the example of zero and one and measure the accuracy and we compare the accuracy and uh, understand what is, whether there's loss or gain and if we, there is a loss or gain what is that we do the same for both reusability and replaceability uh, does that answer your question yeah thank you thanks uh Ranjit, for your details uh maybe you can have one more question i have to... one question actually for Tofi oh, go ahead, regarding please. the code bird uh, I was just wondering whether there might be some data leakage uh, in using CodePert for for fine-tuned tasks. I mean, as we so, know, CodePert was trained on big data set with multiple languages, right? So yes. if you train CodePert on a fine-tuned task, let's say code summarization, then would would there be some, let's say, the data leakage or the, some chance of you know leak some data leakage for the fine-tuned task? Okay, uh, there are several aspects of this, like uh, the code search, uh, the code glue data set is actually um, prepared uh, in a way like the training test and um, training test and validation. They use the same splits for the pre-training and both fine tuning of code summarization. So if uh, at least we, we are assured that the pre-trained model has not seen the test data for the summarization task. And uh, regarding this uh, like cross-lingual uh, clone, this is, uh, yeah, that is not well studied yet. Like when we mix these uh, languages for like Python and Java, there can be have some clones, but uh, that is not, um, I'm, we are not sure yet, but uh, there is no exact matches because the syntax is completely different. So uh, we are pretty much sure that there is no exact leakage, but yeah, well, it can happen to some extent. Okay, so thank you for, for the answer. Okay, thank you. great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have uh, one question. So that was thank really you. nice to work. So I mean, uh, if I understand correctly, you are proposing a multilingual uh, model. And mm -hmm. My question is that uh, whenever there is a new language, do you need to train the model again? And if that is the case, and 
is there any way you can build something language agnostic mode so for the summarization task we believe like uh, uh, these uh, like uh, new models like uh, the um these the code to five uh, which is like came after our work and also the work we are presenting here like this uh, multilingual uh, code bird and graph code bird this multilingual code bird and graph code but if you take this model and fine tune on a few samples like maybe 15 to like 20 data that will give you i believe uh, very good results the code t5 will not we have done some experiment on that because the decoder is not trained to generate natural languages so we need like 150 to 200 data to make it work the code t5 one so if a new language came i would say if your decoder is trained to generate natural languages like pl bird and this uh, multilingual code bird maybe only a few languages enough to achieve good results but uh, it's all experimental we see if the language uses very different set of identifiers mm -hmm. then we may need more data yeah, thank, thank you. you thank you guys uh, any other questions comments we still have a few minutes Let me maybe have one quick question to Anieska on, uh, so I, I appreciate the extensive experiments that you have done comparing your work with the uh, baselines. So I'm wondering if there are any specific situations where your uh, approach is more successful than others or less successful. So when looking at the results, is there any like uh, specific situation that, that, that catches your eyes? Uh, yes, so we actually did an error analysis on our model. So we discovered that uh, in the case of our very particular architecture, uh, what matters the most is the number of code tokens that can overflow our model so it can struggle uh, with a lot of code names. And that was the time when we saw vector space model doing extremely, extremely well. So overall, we saw that uh, those supervised architectures, uh, like our model FBL BERT and also uh, T BERT model, they do better when uh, they do better for not localized bug reports. So those are the bug reports that have no mention of like any class, very natural language description. So those model uh, perform better for such bug reports, also for partially localized bug reports that have little mentions of classes, uh, and then for fully localized bug reports with that mention a lot of different uh, code tokens. Typically, vector space model works best. Okay, great. So, thank you very much. Any other questions? Otherwise, let us wrap up the session. So, I would like to thank you again for your nice presentations, also for the participants. Thank you for attending, for your questions, your comments. Uh, I'm glad to be chair of this session, and uh, so now we will be closing this session and uh, enjoy the, the remaining sessions of uh, ICSI and uh, see you around. Thank you very much. Bye.